Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. In our super-connected modern world, we tend to take for granted our almost instantaneous access to information. When a celebrity dies, or when a politician says something stupid, or when, God forbid, a group of poor, bearded religious radicals attack somewhere in the world, Twitter might let us know even before the news has done a write-up about it. Now, I think most of us are actually aware of the marvel that is modern communications. We realize that this access is unprecedented, but more and more it's becoming an expected part of everyday life. I know that, personally, I tend to expect fresh news every morning as part of my daily ritual. Well, back in the late 17th century, the world was undergoing a similar revolution. It was nowhere near as instantaneous as what we have today, but news was moving faster than ever before. Largely, this was due to improvements in their ships. The nations of Europe, primarily, were immersed in something of an arms race, unlike any that the world had really seen before. Now, the English Navy was modernizing as fast as possible, as were the French. The Spanish and the Portuguese navies were beginning to fall behind, but they still had shipyards that were second to none, and more than anyone else, and they could outproduce any other nation. However, all of these nations, basically every nation in Europe, was left behind in the wake of the Dutch. The Dutch were busy taking over the Asian spice trade from Portugal, and generally they were building a worldwide trade empire. Now, later, in the future, we'll be looking much more at the Dutch, but what's important to us today is the ships they had and their speed. They were designing vessels that could tackle the voyage from northern Europe to southeast Asia with ease, and the other nations of Europe were trying to copy those ship designs. We're talking about vessels that could round the Cape of Africa and survive the monsoons of the South Pacific. For vessels that were designed to survive these long and hazardous voyages... A jaunt across the Atlantic was nothing. Now, there were hurricanes, to be sure, and unruly trade winds all around the world, but what they call the triangle trade was booming. That's ships from Europe sailing to Africa to pick up slaves, sailing west to the Caribbean to drop off slaves and to pick up the fruits of their labor. Sugar, tobacco, cotton, ambergris, and basically a whole host of other exotic fruits and vegetables. Then they would take those goods and travel back to Europe. By the late 17th century, the Triangle trade routes were an international superhighway. Hundreds and hundreds of ships a year made this voyage, and they were becoming exceedingly good at it. With the right ship, the voyage from Cuba to Spain could reliably be made with the right ship and favorable winds in a month, and certainly no more than two. In addition to the produce of the plantation system, these ships were carrying another equally valuable commodity. They were carrying news. Now, that news typically came in the form of correspondence, letters from your friends or family members or associates. You know, something like, Dear Father, I hope this letter finds you well. Mary has fully recovered from the childbirth. Oh, by the way, England and Spain have signed a treaty, so whatever you do, don't send 2,000 men to attack one of their cities. Give mother my love. Regards, Thomas. However, when the news was dire, they would send the fastest ships they had available. For example, when 400 poor, bearded, religious radicals appeared on Providence Island and sacked the castle there, a ship sailed immediately for Havana and then on to Spain with news of the attack. If we assume that the ship sailed under optimal conditions, it's possible that it could have reached Spain before even Captain Morgan made his move on San Lorenzo Castle. I'd like you to imagine it. Your nation, wherever that may be, signs a treaty with your most antagonistic enemy. Then, Word comes that that same nation attacked one of your military bases. Then, only a couple of weeks later, that they've occupied that base and moved on to attack another. And later, that they're planning to attack one of your richest cosmopolitan cities. Not to worry, though, the city is defended by the best and the bravest your nation has to offer. Then, in two more weeks, another messenger ship. These heathens defeated your army, they pillaged the city, they tortured, raped, murdered, defiled churches, threw babies from rooftops, and finally burned the city to the ground. 
all this in the wake of signing a peace treaty with you, with the formal legal backing of the governor there, how would you feel? How would your government react? Someone would have to pay for this. This is episode 33, Payment. After the attack on Panama, Henry Morgan arrived home to Port Royal in what had become the usual fashion. He was hailed as a conquering hero by everyone from beggars and prostitutes to merchants and planters. But the celebrations quickly died. There were only four ships, the Mayflower, the Pearl, the Dolphin, and the Mary, when there should have been a dozen and more. The captains were Morgan's most trusted confidants, but not the swaggering captains typical of the Brethren of the Coast that the people of Port Royal had come to expect. Now these men on board these ships should have been unloading unruly pirates with pockets full of gold ready to be spent, but the men disembarking were the closest thing to respectable that Morgan had under his command. These were soldiers rather than buccaneers. Now their plunder would spend as well at the local rum sinks and brothels as any other man's, but they would be a little bit less free with it. And then there was the admiral himself. He wasn't the jovial, laughing captain clapping his men on the back and barking out orders that they had come to know and love. Today he was gaunt and hollow-cheeked. He was clearly suffering from some disease picked up in the jungles on the Spanish main. So the throng there on the docks of Port Royal opened up for him as he passed on his way to Spanish Town and to his home. Now the remaining captains, the other four men, were tight-lipped about exactly what had transpired on the voyage. They told their men to be careful with what they said as well. So they unloaded the cargo, what there was of it, and then those men set off for home as well. In the following days, more and more ships did begin to arrive in harbor. Now, these were the single-masted barks, the sloops, and the war canoes, typical of the brethren. They carried the real pirates, the men eagerly awaited by those rum mongers and doxies and card sharks, but even they were a disappointment. Upon returning from a raid, they were known to shower every business in sight with custom, be free with whatever money they had, but now they were less than free with their coin. Now, to be sure, every bed and every brothel was filled that night, and every man was drunk, but... They weren't the raucous, rambunctious crowd that was expected. Instead of buying rounds for everyone in sight and making foolhardy bets, they were huddled around tables in every tavern. They were grumbling into their rum and sinking into dark, sullen silences. Now, naturally, everybody with an interest in trading with the buccaneers wanted to know what was going on, but it was probably the prostitutes that learned what was happening first. Any man who knew what he was about would have gone to them. They would trade their secrets as quickly as their charms. Eventually, though, one way or another, it came out that the raid had been a disappointment and that the men hadn't received the great rewards that had been promised to them. Now, most of the men would need to find new voyages or even new crews or perhaps a voyage to cut logwood, and many did do just that, but still... Port Royal was filled to bursting with dissatisfied men who were rapidly drinking through the last of their coin. After a few weeks, a French buccaneer vessel sailed into town, carrying the surgeon Alexander Exquemelin. That crew in particular had a tale of woe and hardship after Panama, and they told it freely. But Exquemelin himself had a lot more to say. He was... After all, a learned man, and he knew how to read and write, something relatively rare among the buccaneers. Back in Panama, he'd begun to write an account of what had happened there and on the Isthmus, and he planned to write an account of Captain Morgan and all of his exploits. So he began to speak to all the old buccaneers in Port Royal all of the prostitutes and the merchants there. He asked all of them what they knew about Captain Morgan and about his time as Admiral of the Jamaica Station. He asked them about the history of Port Royal and Tortuga and about the Brethren of the Coast. And he began to outline his narrative and really build a case against Henry Morgan. Now all of the men, 
seemingly, grumbled that they'd been cheated, but none louder than Exquamelon himself. They believed that Morgan and his associates, those four most trusted captains and their crews, had kept the largest shares of Panama's plunder to themselves and buried it, either on Captain Morgan's estate or back on Providence Island or on Cuba or basically anywhere they could imagine. Now, another surgeon on the voyage, the man who was actually the head surgeon directly under Morgan, wrote, quote, There have been very great complaints by the wronged seamen against Admiral Morgan, Collier, and other commanders, but nothing could be done. Then he goes on, They gave what they pleased for which we must be content or else be clapped in irons. End quote. He complained in a public letter that the men on board the voyage had been injured and killed, some of them lost at sea, and everybody who was left only received ten pounds silver. He continued in his letter, quote, "...cannot tell what infatuated our grandees to send forth such a fleet on so slender an account, can find no other cause but a pitiful small Spanish man-o'-war of eight guns, which came vaporing upon these coasts with the commission from the Queen of Spain, took one small vessel, burnt four or five houses, and took away about thirty live hogs, and he himself was taken with the ship. We do the Spaniards more mischief in one hour than they can do us in seven years. It is incredible what loss they received by us at Panama. End quote. Now he makes a decent point there, a point that actually a large part of our story today is going to hinge on, but most of the men complained about their lack of pay, never mind the fact that Morgan's orders had been disobeyed. His men let the treasure ship carrying all of Panama's riches slip away from them while they were busy drinking themselves into a stupor, but no, 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 it was all Captain Morgan's fault. Regardless, Morgan had other worries, a lot more troublesome than being surrounded by hundreds of drunken, violent, revenge-minded buccaneers. He was likely in a great deal of trouble. While away in Panama, official word of the peace between England and Spain had come. Now, both he and Governor Modiford had a solid argument in their defense. Though Modiford actually knew of the peace when signing Morgan's letters of mark, there had been no official official notification. They learned about the treaty from friends and family, but not from the Lords of Trade or the Lord First Admiral or the Crown. So, officially speaking, they'd not been informed of the treaty. They weren't responsible for breaking it, and therefore they could pass the buck on up the chain of command. So Morgan put pen to paper and wrote an official report of what had happened in Panama, a report that would actually more closely match the Spanish reports than the records of Exquemelin. Then, Governor Modiford wrote to Lord Arlington back in London, arguing his reasons for allowing Morgan to go back to sea. To summarize those arguments, they look something like this. The Queen of Spain planned and intended to attack Jamaica, then... They carried it out, attacking villages, burning homes, killing and frightening women and children. Remember, Lord Arlington, that letter, when you told me to keep the privateers in the, quote, posture that letter should find them, end quote? Well, I, Governor Modiford, did, and when we were attacked, with no ships or soldiers from England to help, we turned again to those privateers. But you know how these men are. They're unruly. They're uncivilized. They could hardly be kept in check. Really, little better than pirates, and not to be trusted. In truth, it's kind of your fault, Lord Arlington, for not sending me the men and the ships that I requested. But, of course, Governor Modiford said all that very politely and very properly. But he went ahead and sent off those letters, as well as Morgan's report, and everyone hunkered down in Jamaica to await... A response. Some believed at the time that Morgan's fever was merely a ruse, an excuse to stay far from Port Royal and hold up in his manor house. Now, it wasn't. He was really sick, but if it had been a ruse, he would... Well, he would have had very good reason to stay hold up. On the 25th of June, 1671, Two frigates flying English colors were spotted, heading directly for Port Royal. Now, this was a rare occurrence, something that really hadn't been seen since the Oxford's arrival more than a year prior. 
The two ships turned out to be the assistance and the welcome, and they were carrying distinguished passengers. On board were Sir Thomas Lynch and his family. Now, many in Jamaica remembered Lynch and his family, but it's doubtful that any were really, truly happy to see him again. You see, Lynch was a serious man. He was austere, and he was grim. He was still a young man. He was only 38, but already he was afflicted with gout. Now, he had been a capable enough acting governor in his last stint on the island, and a respectable and even respected lieutenant governor, but he wasn't much fun at parties. Still, though, parties were planned in his honor. It appeared that he was in Jamaica to serve once again as lieutenant governor, a position that really hadn't been filled in several years. He had, of course, been given his secret orders after his commission. His primary goal there in Jamaica was actually to arrest Governor Modi Ford, to take his seat as governor, and to either civilize, arrest, or execute any of the pirates in Port Royal. First, though, he would have to secure his position in secret and assess exactly how best to deal with the pirates. After all, it wouldn't do to have hundreds of heavily armed locals kill the new governor and take over the island, wreaking havoc all across the Caribbean. But Lynch was just the man to avoid that. He was careful and calculating. Now, Governor Modiford certainly had reason to be worried, but those worries were likely put at ease when he saw that Lynch's commission was actually dated prior to the raid on Panama. It appeared, if you took a look at that dating, that, well, Lynch wasn't actually there to replace him. And it's here that we actually encounter something of a mystery. Lynch's commission was actually several months old. It was written and signed well before Morgan even set sail for the Maine. This was back when Port Royal was relatively at peace, a little bit after the Spanish would have attacked, but before anybody knew what Morgan was going to go do. So, even despite all of Modi Ford and Morgan's best efforts to curb the buccaneers before Panama, well, it appears that Lynch was going to take over anyway. Now, nobody knows exactly why. This has been often debated, and there's a number of ideas here. First of all, it should be noted that his voyage was definitely expedited by the events that occurred at Panama, and there's a possibility that his orders to actually arrest Modi Ford were added after the fact, but this question does remain. Was Lynch merely meant to take over anyway, and circumstances on the ground changed the timing of his takeover, or was there something more sinister at work here? A few historians have floated the idea that there was something of a conspiracy happening in the highest rungs of the English government. Perhaps some of the Lords of Trade, or perhaps even some of the anti-Spanish members of the Cabal, uh, Lord Arlington comes to mind here, perhaps they actually planned to get one last strike in against Spain before the Treaty of Madrid officially took effect. Now, the commands coming down to Modi Ford uh, regarding the buccaneers, well, they gave him a lot of leeway, a lot of rope, and, you know, the old saying goes, enough rope to hang yourself with, but then, when those buccaneers burned one of Spain's greatest New World possessions to the ground, well, they could still use Modi Ford as the fall guy for that attack. After all, he's a rogue governor, and look, here on his commission, he was actually already scheduled to be replaced. It was signed well before the attack happened on your people, so certainly that can't be laid at the king's feet. However, don't forget that if you ever think to threaten Jamaica again, English pirates can march with impunity to your greatest cities, kill, torture, and turn the city to ash. So... Lieutenant Governor Lynch's first few weeks in Jamaica weren't terribly eventful. He was stricken with gout in the first days after arriving, so he was bedridden for some time. Now, the Lieutenant Governor at the time didn't have an appointed home in Jamaica, so Lynch actually stayed at Modi Ford's Manor until proper accommodations could be either bought or built for him. But when he was finally well enough to move about, he started going to all those dinners thrown in his honor. At Modi Ford's Manor was the first, to be sure, but they were also thrown in the homes of all of Jamaica's more notable families. 
Now, many of those were actually members of the Jamaican Council. Usually these were wealthy planters or merchants or even sometimes ranking soldiers in the militia. So at these dinners, Lynch was able to make contact with many of his old associates from his time as lieutenant governor previously, and even some new, and he probed the situation here. He liked to ask his hosts how they thought Governor Modiford had handled the crisis when Spain attacked. He asked how they felt about the seedier element of Jamaica down Port Royal Way. How did they feel about the rum sinks and the prostitutes and the pirates? How would they feel about a new governor that swept all of that less tasteful element off the island, that bolstered Jamaica's defenses and legitimized Jamaica as a real English colony? More than a few of these notable Jamaicans were receptive. The very few that weren't terribly receptive to his suggestions were noted by Lynch. A few weeks of this and a ship out of Bristol brought news to Jamaica that nearly brought his entire plan crashing down. The captain of that Bristol ship carried news that the governor's own son, Charles Modiford, was actually imprisoned in the Tower of London, awaiting his father's arrest. Now, we mentioned this last week. Charles was something of a hostage to appease the Spanish and also ensure his father the governor's good faith. So Lynch moved on this immediately as soon as he found out about it. He had the captain of that Bristol ship and his men detained on board their vessel, and he set some guards on the docks to watch them. Then he wrote a number of letters to be carried in secret under cover of darkness to some of Jamaica's finest families. First, a letter went to Captain Prince. That was one of Morgan's most trusted commanders, who had been there at Panama, and he told Captain Prince to ready his men and any men he could rally to defend the harbor against any threat that might come, either from the seaward side or the landward. Now, the captain of the local militia was told to arm his men and to prepare to put down a potential uprising. Morgan was still bedridden, and he received no letter at all. But all across the islands, guns were loaded and men were readied. Now, to Modiford, Lynch sent, well, well, not a letter, but an invitation. He sent a runner to go invite the governor to join him as Lynch went to go survey the ships that he had brought to Jamaica. The runner told Modi Ford that, while Lynch had top-secret directives from the Crown to impart to Modi Ford regarding the defense of Jamaica. Now, once Lynch and Modi Ford were all on board the assistance, the larger of the two vessels, along with a number of men, all of whom were loyal to Lynch, well, the governor was told of his subordinate's true purpose on the island. He was told of his son, who was imprisoned in the Tower of London, and of his own impending arrest. Everything was revealed, but to his credit, Modiford didn't resist. He went to his fate with a proper English gentlemanly grace. He was told that his family could remain on the island and be unharmed, or if they chose, return to England, as they wished. And then Lynch softened the blow. He explained to Modi Ford that this was really all politics, that Modi Ford's life and his fortune were not at risk, and that his son would be released from the tower upon the governor's reaching London. Now, what Lynch said was true as far as he knew, but Modi Ford was no doubt aware that kings could be impetuous creatures, and if it was politically expedient, he himself could very soon find the end of his days at the end of a gallows. So it was on the 25th of August, 1671, that Thomas Modiford was transferred to the Jamaica Merchant and began his voyage to England in chains. So that very day, the new governor, Lynch, called the Council of Jamaica to session. There he gave a report of his actions in arresting Modiford and showed everyone assembled a copy of his commission signed by King Charles II of England. Now there were some recriminations on how he carried out his plans, the secrecy of it, but really only a few. These came mainly from the very same men that had been noted as possible malcontents. It was all legal, though, and they all accepted him as the new governor. 
Now, Morgan rightfully had a place at that Jamaica council, but he remained abed. His fever was still bothering him. So Lynch was left free to go to work, corralling the buccaneers as best he could, but he soon found out that it was going to be a difficult task. You see, these buccaneers knew the island much better than Lynch did, and they had grown quite skilled at evading the authorities. Lynch had, of course, been on the island before, but never in such an intimate fashion. He did manage to capture a few and coerce some others into taking up a more respectable trade, but today we're not really concerned with what the rank-and-file buccaneers were doing. We're going to look a lot more at them next time. However, with Morgan laid up, the pirates were laying low. But the governor didn't have long before more pressing news came from London. You see, Spain, after the attack on Panama, was making threatening moves, and apparently the queen had called a council of war. They'd mustered a total of 36 sail and 5,000 men with the apparent plan of attacking Jamaica and retribution. Now, this was about half of what their original force was supposed to be, so it was better than it could have been, but still not good. The Queen Regent chose to keep half of those men back in Europe. This was a tool the better with which to threaten France and England while they were busy fighting in the Netherlands. So the ambassador to Spain, that one who had been a broker for the Treaty of Madrid, well, he had returned to England with the Queen's demands, and those demands were then sent on to Lynch. She had a number of demands, but her primary condition to stay her hand was the arrest, imprisonment, and trial of Admiral Henry Morgan. So here, Governor Lynch found himself in something of a quandary. His masters had ordered... Henry Morgan arrested, and the buccaneers dispersed. At that same moment, though, the Queen of Spain, who had every reason to attack Jamaica, had marshaled a fleet for that very purpose. He had a mere two ships of any fighting capacity and only a few hundred men. Spain's force completely eclipsed his. England was busy mired in the Third Anglo-Dutch War, so he couldn't expect any aid from home. And once again as had been so many times in the past, Captain Morgan was the only man capable of defending Jamaica. So Governor Lynch had a choice. He could gamble on Morgan and let him rouse a force. Of course, Morgan was still sick, and at that moment not to the best standing with the buccaneers. Or, conversely, he could bet on Spain. He could arrest Morgan, send him back to England, and pray that Spanish honor held and that they would be sated with Henry Morgan in chains. It appears that the governor actually did deliberate on exactly what to do here, but in the end he made what was probably the wise decision, and he ordered the arrest of Henry Morgan. Now Morgan was still quite sick, so instead of being immediately shipped off to England, he was put under house arrest for six weeks until he would be well enough to travel. Now Morgan was actually sick, it wasn't a ruse, but this may have been a brilliant tactical move on Lynch's part. You see, he announced Morgan's arrest publicly, as was the proper thing to do. Then he named Major James Bannister to command the militia. The major was well known to the buccaneers and apparently well enough respected. Even better, the governor named Captain Prince his ranking lieutenant, and he made it abundantly clear that though Morgan was under arrest, the other buccaneers weren't to be treated the same. So Governor Lynch, Major Bannister, and Lieutenant Prince convinced many of the buccaneers to stay in Port Royal just in case their services wound up being needed. Now when those six weeks were up, the governor put Morgan on board the Welcome, and on the 6th of April, he sent the vessel on her voyage to England. Now Lynch did offer Morgan one kindness. He sent with him a letter that was to be delivered to the king and the council that read, quote, to speak the truth of him, he's an honest and brave fellow, and had both Sir T. M. and the council's commission and instructions, which they thought he obeyed and followed so well that they gave him public thanks. End quote. Major Bannister, the commander of the militia, had similar words of praise. He wrote, quote, Admiral Henry Morgan is sent home confined in the welcome frigate to appear, as is suspected, on account of his proceedings against the Spaniard. 
knows not what approbation he may find there, but he received here a very high and honorable applause for his noble service therein, both from Sir Thomas Modiford and the council that commissioned him. Hopes without offense he may say he is a very well-deserving person, and one of great courage and conduct, who may, with his majesty's pleasure, perform good public service at home, or be very advantageous to this island, if war should again break forth with the Spaniard. End quote. However, none of this was probably all that soothing for Morgan, considering his situation. He was still sick. He was clapped in irons. He was imprisoned in the cold, wet depths of a leaky little cog making her way across the Atlantic, and every day the weather was getting colder and colder. And to rub salt in the wound, he was accompanied by another man, an English pirate who had been on the voyage to Panama, a man named Captain Francis Witherborn. Now, of course, there's no record of their conversations, but can you imagine what they were like? Imagine there you are, in chains, being transported back to England to face your almost certain death at the end of a hangman's noose. And right next to you is your former admiral, a man who promised to make you rich. But then instead of wealth, he gave you nothing but hunger and disease, pain, fire, and death. I mean, what would you say to him? But regardless of their conversations, Morgan arrived safely in England on the 4th of July in 1671. And in a sense, you could see it as his own sort of Independence Day. You see, instead of being marched under guard to the nearest cell, as he probably expected, he was received by the local dignitaries and given a place to rest and recover from his voyage. These dignitaries fed him and had his needs looked after. Likely, they called the local doctor to examine the admiral. Now, this might not be too far out of the ordinary. He was, after all, an admiral. He was a landed man, not just some common criminal off the street, but... He was under arrest, wasn't he? Well, technically, yes, he was under arrest, but his hosts had news to impart to Morgan. You see, the war with the Dutch was going pretty poorly. England had lost engagement after engagement. Now, France fared a little bit better in the war, but all in all, the Netherlands was winning. England was at a low point in the war. Of particular interest to Morgan was the state of affairs in Jamaica. You see, Spain had actually cooled her heels in the months that Morgan had been at sea, but the Dutch were amassing a fleet in the Caribbean uh, perilously close to the shores of Jamaica. So it appeared that things had changed while he was at sea. Perhaps things had changed to Captain Morgan's advantage. When he finally arrived in London town, well... Well, the city must have seemed alien to the buccaneer, but in some ways it was more like Port Royal than he would have expected, than the England that he had left years ago. Now, first off, he was told not to leave the city without giving notice, but otherwise he was basically left free to roam. But London... Well, London was at the height of restoration, magnificence, and debauchery, the streets were filled with drunken revelry, loose women, and opulence. It was wealthier, to be sure, than the streets of Port Royal, and the revelers were dressed better, but it probably felt something like home. So Morgan took rooms in the city and bought new clothes that would be more suitable for the climate and the culture. After he spent a little bit of time recovering his health, he found himself to be... A desirable commodity. Only a couple of weeks prior, he had thought himself bound for the Tower of London and potentially for the headsman. But now? Well, now, Modiford had actually been released from the Tower, and Morgan found himself at a different house every night being feasted and toasted by the occupants. He was the guest of honor everywhere that he went, and his schedule was full for the foreseeable future. And in addition to food and the drink that he was given, he was, well, he was expected to entertain. You see, he was an oddity to the London elite. Now, the buccaneers of the Caribbean had been built up back in Europe as a scourge. They were a gang of monsters, reaving and raping their way across the Spanish main. These weren't the kind of men that you could exactly invite to dinner to regale you with stories of their exploits. But Morgan? He was a gentleman a man of letters and estates, 
and the king of that band of ragged pirates. So regale them he did. Night after night, Morgan told them stories of his adventures, while his narrow escapes and glorious triumphs. But there was something deeper going on here as well, and Morgan knew it. He used this situation to his advantage. You see, these evenings weren't just chest-thumping stories to make the women gasp. He was telling his tales to people of real means and real influence. Some held actual positions of power in the government, some at the highest levels, even a few in the king's cabal. You see, Morgan hadn't even seen the inside of a cell, and he hadn't been sent to a trial, but every night he testified in his defense in front of the court of public opinion. And every night, his peers, well, they laughed and they cheered for him. You see, the court of King Charles was split on a very divisive issue. In public, that issue was the royal position on Spain, but more honestly, it was the growing Catholic tide there in England. Now, most of those that invited Morgan to dine were on the side of Anglicanism and against closer relations with Spain, and their numbers in England were growing. As the war with the Netherlands, the Third Anglo-Dutch War, went worse and worse, more people all across the country were asking themselves, why were they fighting against their Protestant cousins across the Channel and busy cozying up to their ancient and Catholic enemies in Spain and France? So Morgan found himself a tool of a political faction now. He was a cog in a much bigger machine. You see, his victory on the field of battle outside Panama was the last notable English victory in years. And what a victory it was. I mean, while English troops were busy dying in the war with the Netherlands, all one had to do was turn to Morgan to tell of him marching his band of intrepid English rovers against a mounted and organized Spanish army and then defeating them in open combat. See, more and more... The highest halls of power, all the way from King Charles down, were ringing with the name of Captain Morgan. However, Morgan began to grow tired of the capital and more than a little bit annoyed, so for a time he left London to go visit his relatives over in Wales. All in all, this journey had lasted about two years, and he was frustrated with the pace of things there, as well as the money that he was losing while he was away from his plantations and busy spending money on all sorts of new clothes and all of the expenses of living in London. And his eventual release still wasn't exactly certain. You see, his fate rested with the anti-Spain faction in London and their triumph in the heart and mind of King Charles. And Really, considering the king's love of all things French and even his rumored religious inclinations, well, Morgan was still far from safe. But he had found in London something of an ally, a man who was part patron and part worshipful acolyte. His name was Christopher Monk. Now, do you remember George Monk, the royalist general that was largely responsible for restoring King Charles to the throne? The man that Henry Morgan's uncle had actually served directly under as his second-in-command during the Civil War? Yeah, well, this Christopher Monk was his son. So this was the son of the man that King Charles had personally thanked for winning his throne, and now he was firmly in the camp of Henry Morgan. You see, Christopher was merely 19 years old. He was rich. He was quick-tempered. He was a little bit dashing, a little bit dangerous. He liked to drink, and he liked to swagger around with a sword on his hip, looking for anybody that would be willing to fight him. In short, he was a rogue, growing bored with betting barmaids and fighting in the streets. Then, into this world of boredom, walks a man with long hair and impeccable facial hair. A man who was wearing a sword, but was wearing it like it was born with him. A man that held himself with an air of menace and command. And, I mean, he'd been there. You know, this man had sailed against savages and Spaniards. He'd cut traitors' throats and plundered the greatest cities in the New World. 
He marched the jungles of Panama just like Francis Drake had done, and he ravaged noble ladies while their husbands played politics and smoked with savage witch doctors. I mean, he'd really done it, man. So it was a natural match. Clearly, Christopher attached himself to Morgan as fast as possible, but as for Morgan's side of the bargain, well, the boy was influential, and there was a familial connection there, so he made a smart ally, but... Beyond that, Christopher Monk was young, and he liked to drink, and he liked to fight, and, well, in short, it was the very kind of person that Morgan had fought with, the very kind of boy that Morgan had commanded, and ultimately the kind of boy that Morgan had become an expert at manipulating. And then, quite possibly with the aid of young Christopher, Henry Morgan received a missive from the king himself. It asked him to draw up a plan for the future defense of Jamaica, an outline of the necessary materials and the strategies that Morgan would employ were he, hypothetically, returned to Jamaica in a position of real power. You see, the war continued to go badly, and the Dutch had been harassing English shipping all across the Caribbean, really all across the world. But in the Caribbean, it was making Lynch look bad, and by extension it was making England and all of her possessions look weak. You see, that had never been a problem when Morgan was in Jamaica. Naturally, first thing, Morgan wrote and sent the memo immediately. He asked for the materials you might imagine, you know, the guns, the ships, the men, the money. But his plan, well, his plan was bold. His plan was to bolster the defenses of Port Royal, but then to bring the fight out to the Dutch. They were only winning, argued Morgan, because Lynch was on the defensive. This was a classic tactic of Morgan. Then, in July 1673, King Charles called Morgan to meet with him personally to discuss his plans. So Morgan dressed as well as he could. He had his shoes shined, and he had his hair done. He'd passed well enough in the upper echelons of London society, but still, meeting the king, there was no way for him to appear anything but what he was. He was a rough, seasoned sailor and a soldier of fortune. So King Charles and Captain Morgan met publicly. Then they retired to a private meeting room for the better part of an afternoon. Now what they said wasn't recorded officially, but it's reported that the king was charmed by Morgan's rough colonial manner of his royalist history and of the tales of his dashing English victories. That was just the sort of thing that the king loved. But then he came to it, the point. He asked Morgan about the sack of Panama. You see... Governor Modi Ford's excuses and his defense had been pretty paltry, not really worth the king's time. But you see, that was on his head, not on Morgan's. The king needed to know, to quote Douglas R. Burgess Jr. and the Pirates Pact, quote, Morgan stoutly maintained that he believed the governor of Panama was assembling a fleet to invade Jamaica. "'But surely the governor must have told you that England and Spain were at peace?' Charles asked, disbelievingly. "'If anyone had,' Morgan answered, it had escaped his memory. "'He had, he confessed, a poor memory for political matters.' "'The king's eyebrows rose, and, anyway,' Morgan went on. "'Even if the governor or any of the Spanish officers had told him that, "'he would never have believed them. "'The Spanish were nothing but liars. "'Everyone knew that.' king and pirate gazed at one another for a long moment. Then, without warning, Charles cried out, Odd fish! and burst into laughter. The interrogation was adjourned. End quote. In the months that followed meeting the king, well, Henry Morgan's fortunes changed, in ways that I doubt he ever could have foreseen. You see, as a young man, he'd been a royalist in Cromwell's anti-royal England. He was bundled on a vessel, bound for the New World to escape a headsman, really, on what was almost a suicidal mission to attack the Spanish halfway around the world. It was his own ambition and his intrepid skill that helped him to climb as high as he likely thought possible. 
He had raided the Spanish main more than any other man alive. He had gathered men of all colors and creeds to his banner. And finally, he'd unified the Brethren of the Coast, commanded almost every buccaneer in the Caribbean, and been admiral of the greatest pirate fleet the world had ever known. He'd raised himself to the highest level of society available to him there in Jamaica. But then, once again, he'd fallen low. He'd gone home, once again facing that same headsman he'd outrun twenty years ago. And then he was welcomed by the King of England. He was greeted warmly at court. He was finally granted a knighthood to become officially Admiral Sir Henry Morgan. King Charles even gifted him a snuff box with the king's own likeness outlined in diamonds. And finally, when all was said and done, he was given, in November of 1673, a commission, signed by King Charles, as the Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica, and he sailed home. Now the story of Captain Morgan doesn't end here. He goes on to live for many more years. But the story of Captain Morgan, the pirate, ended in that meeting with the king. From here on out, Captain Morgan isn't going to be a pirate anymore. Now, sure, he will, in his later years, occasionally be found drinking with some of the rougher sort there in the rum sinks in Port Royal, but he won't be a pirate anymore. He's going to be a man who's working for the state, actively persecuting any pirates he comes across. We'll look in on him a few more times before the end of Captain Morgan's days, but next time we're going to leave Captain Morgan behind and take a look at what happened to some of the other men who were there at Panama. We're going to rewind to the immediate aftermath of the attack on Panama and follow some of the men that were there, men like Francis Witherborn, Alexander X. Gomelin, and Captain Bartholomew Sharp. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and I'd like to thank you for listening. As always, I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. Anybody who has left us a review on iTunes or wherever it is you happen to listen to the show, everybody who has donated or signed up to be one of our patrons on Patreon, well, I appreciate all of you, and I couldn't do the show without you guys. As always, our theme music was The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, go on over and do so at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can check us out on Facebook, SoundCloud, Twitter, or YouTube. As always, most importantly, thank you for listening.